Okay, we are live. Welcome to the Sunday Lovecraft Easing Show. Uh, today is wow, it's June, June the first, two thousand fourteen, and today we are lucky enough to have this lady, Livia Llewellyn, on the show. Um, and I also want to say that sure glad to have Mr. Pulver back here on the panel. He's been going through some health things for the last month or so. So, um, but he really wanted to be here for. For Olivia's uh, show, um, Joe uh, edited a really great anthology called uh, "The Grim, Grim Scribes Puppets," which uh, which was a uh, which is a uh, tribute to Thomas Ligotti's work. And uh, correct me if I get anything wrong, Joe, but Joe uh, has been nominated for a Stoker on that. I and, was yes, and something else. And the Shirley Jackson. Uh, Shirley Jackson, right, the big and one. I've been nominated uh, for a Shirley Jackson Award. And the story that leads off Grim Scribes Puppets. Exactly, that's what I was about to say. That. by Olivia. And that's nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award. Yay! Yep, the very first story in that, uh, that anthology was written by Olivia Llewellyn and, as Joe just said, nominated for a Stoker Award. Uh, no, a Shirley Jackson Award. And this is oh, not, this? And be, I'll, I'll give it back to you in one second, Mike, but yeah. this is not Livia's first nomination for Shirley Jackson Awards. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought it was a Stoker. I get all these awards mixed no, up. No, it was a Shirley Jackson. <clears throat> okay, okay. Which is right. Daniel Queen. Yeah, they're all the same to me. <laughs> <laughs> They both uh, with ass, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, thanks for being here, Olivia. Um, the first question I want to ask you, and, and guys, please feel free to jump in. I don't want to be the only one uh, talking. But, Olivia, for those out there who don't, I'd like to start just simply with those out there who don't know who you are. Um, could you just talk to those people, explain a little bit about who you are? I think I read you used to... Uh, be in show business of some sort, is that right? Yes, um, marginally. Um, I came to New York 20 years ago to be an actor. Um, I enrolled at NYU in their graduate program. I wanted to be classically trained. I wanted to do Shakespeare. I took a lot of training. Um, as you can see, that worked out really well. I ended up with a huge amount of student loans that I'll never pay off. <laughs> And I spent most of my time just, you know, working retail jobs, and I, I couldn't do the waitressing jobs that that most actors do. Um, and uh, you know, I wasn't I wasn't getting cast in a lot of stuff. So I started working in, at Barnes and Noble, and I met someone there who was working for the Association of um, American University Presses. And when she left her job there, she was working at Barnes & Noble part-time, she uh, invited me to submit a resume, and so that's kind of how I got into publishing. Uh, but I was still acting, I was just, I had a day job and I could pay the bills, and I was very happy about that, but I knew then that I was not going to be, you know, an actor. Um, but I was still doing a lot of, like, off-off-Broadway stuff. And um, then in the early 2000s, I realized it was just... I wasn't doing anything I wanted to do, and I was getting to the point where I was going to auditions and people were saying, well, you don't look sexy enough for Shakespeare, so we can't hire you. And I'm like, okay, that <laughs> I, I think I'm done. I'm done with acting. Um, so uh, I started, I'd, I'd started writing, you know, all, well, I was writing throughout all of this, like little short stories, and in the 1990s, I was like experimenting with hypertext fiction online. Um, but it wasn't until I left acting completely that I started writing and realized um, that my love for the words that I spoke on stage could e be easily transferred over to, to writing words, because it, it's still all about language. So, right. so, yeah, so that's my very short version of my story. Uh, I also saw a really, I thought, touching little story from when you were... Young, uh, about a, an old gentleman by the name of Mr. Monk. 
I was wondering if you'd talk about that for a second. If you... Oh, Mr. Monk, yes, in Tacoma, Washington. My parents, um, my father was a teacher, um, and my mother was a, a grade school teacher uh, who stopped when she had me and my sister. But our house was filled with books, and in Tacoma, Washington, they would, you know, go around to all these different places. Didn't have to be like a regular chain, like Walden's, or Dalton at that time. <clears throat> There was a small antique store uh, called Mr. Monk's. It was run by uh, this t tiny little wizened old man named Mr. Monk. He, <laughs> he you know, some of this was some of the stuff was his antiques, like from his living room. He would just bring it into the store, and you know his family and friends would leave stuff there. And he had this huge uh, bookcase in the back that was filled with all kinds of pulp paperbacks from the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, very early 70s, and they were all science fiction and fantasy. And I was really young, um, and but I read everything. And my mother, um, you know, she, she, was, she was kind of a, a 50s, 60s style mom. Uh, but when it came to books, she didn't censor me. Didn't matter. It could have like the most hideous things on the cover, and she was like, that's fine. It's, 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 she's reading. And so, he took me into the back room one day with my mother and he said you can pick out five paperbacks so I picked out I, I still have these paperbacks um, uh, Tales of the, from the White Heart by Arthur C. Clarke The War of the Newts um, this little book that had four science fiction novellas in it uh, the, the book itself is extremely small uh, and then two other books that I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was it was those three books that really, uh, and and that kind of got me started with with science fiction and fantasy because I'd never seen I'd never seen books like that before that had those kind of covers and they had monsters and women screaming and or you know shooting lasers. And <laughs> but he also did something really really touching too. He didn't he slip some more. Books in the in the bags. Yes, he did. I was allowed five books, but he he gave me many many more books. <laughs> nice <guy. laughs> yeah, so so five books meant like more like ten or twelve or <laughs> so so yeah, and and my father still he still collects books to this day, um, and uh, we'll go into all of these old bookstores in Tacoma, and uh, it's still still the same kind of guys who love to talk about reading and writing and, and, and just anything having to do with books, and uh, they give my dad books all the time, and I'll, I'll still go with him, even though I'm 50 years old, and I'll be standing next to him and be like, here, have a book, you know. <laughs> this one, here's a Stephen King, you know, I'll be like, oh my god, you know. <laughs> so, some things never change. <laughs> uh, for everybody watching, uh, I linked on the website today to Olivia's uh, book. Uh, I'm sorry, the title keeps going out of my head. Engines of Sacrifice. Do I have that right? Engines of Desire. Engines of Desire. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, pulling it up here. Tales of Love and Other Horrors by Olivia Llewellyn. I've got I've got it linked on the front page of the website, uh, so you can. It's available on Kindle, so you can read it today if you want, or you can order it for print. So. Uh, I got a bunch of questions here, but like I said, I don't want to hog the forum. Joe, do you want to bother um, with anything? Well, you just mentioned Engines of Desire, which mm -hmm. is uh, I and quite a few other pe people consider it, considered it the best anthology uh, the year it came out. Um, yeah, I love taking that. It has an introduction by Laird Barron, mm -hmm. and I'll read the first paragraph, which is brief, but has... The thing you need to know to be braced for is that Livy Llewellyn doesn't screw around. There are images you can't unsee because they're scorched on your brain. Steal yourself. That is about as apt as you could get. Um, yeah. <laughs> she does not screw around. If you are interested in language, the book is full of language, and and some of it's the kind of language you might suspect from people who don't screw around. Um, this is a book that has teeth. Not only is it inventive and impeccably written, but 
this when Laird says brace yourself, indeed brace yourself. Um, when he discusses there are things once seen that cannot be unseen, this 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 woman is a master of that. Scorching, searing, every and here I'll use one of Olivia's favorite words. Every fucking word. <laughs> this, this <Yay>! book, <laughs> yes, with all oh, the ex virgin ears. Um, <laughs> um, I I really free. loved that. I loved the whole book, but I really loved uh, "Take Your Daughters to Work." No, uh, "Take Your Daughters to Work." Who, who didn't love it? I, yeah. um, I, I, my recollection is Ellen praised it highly. Um, th this book was nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award. Um, uh, I forget with one of the stories in here was also. Uh, oh, um, follows. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I forgot which one, but no, I knew that's one okay. of them was. Yeah, no, that's uh, okay. I'm sorry, um, I, didn't catch, I didn't catch which one it was. Uh, so that alone should tell you the, the caliber of this woman's writing uh, and, and the power of this particular collection of fiction. Um, I still, even though this book's been out, what, 2009, 10? 11. It's been out f four years now. Okay, I still occasionally just put up the Amazon link to it because in the last four or five years, this is one of the best books that I've had the pleasure to read. I didn't uh, catch um, which story in in that anthology was nominated. It was the novelette on Follows. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, and, you know... I don't pick somebody, pick Laird, pick Pulver, pick Ellen, pick Langan, pick any of those names you know, and they all will tell you that Livia is about as good a writer working as we have. Um, and then put all those exclamation marks after that that I normally <laughs> use. Um, but, you know, um, I'm delighted to have the chance to have worked with her. Um, uh, I was honored and privileged to receive Furnace for Grim Scribes Puppets. Uh, I, I don't have words for any, anybody who's read this story or for those of you who will go out and find this story and read it. At the end of it, you'll know exactly how I felt the day I opened my email and, and there the story was, and I, I read it immediately. Um, and was floored. Her 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 work is staggeringly good. Uh, and and I'll shut up for a minute and let somebody else jump in. Um. Well, we we know you're we we know you like cosmic horror, of course. I really wanted to ask you, um, what is it about cosmic horror? Uh, I know what it what it is what it is for me and. What is for other people, but for you, what is it about cosmic horror that uh, I don't know, pushes your buttons, so to speak? What fascinates you about that? I, I I've thought about that a lot. I'm I'm am re really not sure. There's just, mm -hmm. um, I guess, you know, right now I'm sitting in this kitchen and living room, surrounded by all this crap, and I go to my shitty job, and um, you know. 40 years from now I'll be dead and mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it seems like such such a lot of effort for such a mundane existence um, especially when I know that there's so much more out there in the universe that's so utterly mind-blowing that we can't comprehend it and I think that's it's the incomprehensibility of it that that comforts me in a way um, even though I'm really not contributing to it um, by being alive in any sense whatsoever, um, and I don't know what it says about me, but you know, I don't, I don't really believe in in God, but I believe in in the universe, or you know, this collection of universes, or whatever it is we call it, and that there might be something out there, and and maybe in death I'll find out. I don't know. Um, 
I, I, I really that's and that really <laughs> doesn't explain what I, I love about it. But it's one of the things that it is hard to explain. You know, it really that. is. It really is. But I guess you can't explain the unexplainable, and that's it's it's a it's a puzzle. It's um. You know, it's a mystery that can never be solved, and I love that because that means that we can all, in our own way, attempt to solve it and come up with different ways to solve it. Lovecraft has ha had his way, and Laird has his way, and Joe has his way, and I have my way, and we all approached it using, you know, whatever tools in our in our you know in mental basket we have, and we come up with with different answers for you know why. Um, and what is it? And does it even matter? And so, you know, that I think that just the fact that it is a mystery is is what's so fascinating. It it will never be solved. It, is that when you discovered Lovecraft when Mr. Monk put that Lovecraft book in your in your bag that day, or had you? No, I discovered Lovecraft in my junior high school library. They mm -hmm. had the old paperback editions that had the faces on them with like the weird things crawling out of the eye sockets and uh, the, the tortured faces and I would take those books home and I would like stare at them for hours. Yes! <laughs> They're on hold. So. Let me, now keep holding that up, Joe. I'll put you on the screen for everybody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just want myself a little. <laughs> there you go. Okay, thanks. Live, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no one is watching. Yeah, anything. no one at all. <laughs> and the internet forgets everything. It's not being recorded. And, and this yeah. is the ultimate John Holmes cover. Yeah, yeah, the, the earlier one was kind of mild compared to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, aren't those covers to this, great? To this day, it's my favorite book cover ever. <clears throat> yeah, I love that. It's like, what. What twelve-year-old girl in junior high school who just wants to be popular and maybe be cheerleader someday? Who doesn't love shit like that? <laughs> I don't know. There weren't any in my school that didn't think I was a weirdo for reading that stuff. <laughs> my life would have been much different. <laughs> you went to the wrong school. <laughs> yeah, apparently so. <laughs> oh, my school boy. was full of all kinds of crazy people. <laughs> To have that in your library, I think, you know, says it all. <laughs> uh, I got some more questions, too, but Joe or Rick, do you have a question for Olivia? Rick? Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've got plenty. All right. So, Olivia, you were talking earlier about your, when Mike asked you about Cosmic Horror, you talk, talk about the futility of existence and whatnot, and the drudgery of the day job. It, it, it struck me very clearly that that's pretty much a summary of take your take your girls to work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can prepare your kids for whatever. And and the reality is when we release our children into the world, no matter what we've done, it's actually much, much worse than we've tried to show them. And well, and that that story is set in my my, you know, mythical South American continent-wide city of Obsidia that exists only to bring up relay from the Southern Ocean. And so all of these people are supposedly working for the cosmic, and yet their lives are filled with a lot of drudgery. It's all, you know, mines and, you know, bureaucracy and, mm -hmm. you know, and... <laughs> And I kind of, I kind of like the, I like the juxtaposition of that. I, I know a lot of people really hate Joss Whedon and Buffy and Cabin in the Woods. And other people really love it. I love the fact that he's able to combine cosmic horror with the drudgery of the office life. <laughs> and and I, <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a big Buffy and Angel fan. They're both kind of the same. <laughs> Or the corporation in, um, or Wayland Utani, you know, in in <laughs> Alien, you know, that's. Mm -hmm. Hello. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> you know, for for those people that have a cause, though, like the people in your story, that that mundaneness, uh, the drudgery is probably easier to bear for them because they've got this purpose that they're working towards, yeah. you know, as opposed to just, you know, your job, for instance, your purpose is simply just to 
be able to pay the bills. And many yeah, people, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not quite the same as being told, well, you know, at the end of your years of service, you'll be eaten by our dog, God, you know. And then I'd be yeah, like, you don't have that to look <laughs> bonus I was looking for, but maybe it is, you know. <laughs> you don't get a gold watch, you get Cthulhu at the end. Well, actually, I work for one of the big five publishers, and, and I believe you may have heard the fight we're having right now with Amazon, so we might actually be eaten by a large dark god who lives in Seattle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. yeah, that was a, a raw nerve. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, who, is, who are some of your favorite authors? Um, wow. I have very wide-ranging tastes. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, Caitlin Kiernan, Laird Barron. Um, I love Joe's work. Um, I love poetry, and I love the decadence. I love Baudelaire. I love Verlaine. I love Rimbaud. Um, you know, I love George Bataille, the story of the eye. Um, I love a lot of the beat poets um, and the beat writers. Um, before I came to New York, when I knew I was coming, you know, I was reading a lot of Kerouac because, you know, the, some people that they have that thing where it's, I'm going to New York, I have to read on the road or whatever. But I've been reading a lot of that stuff for years, and and um, then I discovered it all over again when I came to New York and. Um, and uh, you know, I I love how they're able to just break all of the rules with language and and do incredible things with it. Um, <laughs> I really, you know, I, and I also love you know contemporary authors like Donna Tart. You know, I like a lot of you know um, literary authors too. Um, I just finished reading American Elsewhere. And I'm reading this by Robert Jackson Bennett, and uh, his novel is up for the Shirley Jackson Award this year, and and it's beautiful. It's absolutely spectacular, um, and so I'm constantly adding new favorite authors to my list. It's never ending. And yeah, and, and, and you, you can tell by your work how widely outside the box you read and and appreciate, um, which. At now that we're at this, or in this new age of weird fiction, I, I think in general, be it Kiernan, be it Laird, be it Langan, be it Livia, be it Stranzis, we, or, or any number of other people, from Kathy Koja to whoever else we'd like to name, we, we can see how lit, the literary level has the bar has been raised because so many people are reading and have been reading outside the box. Yeah. Um, uh, that 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 writers need to read. All all that reading goes in your toolbox. Um, it, it may seem like algebra that you're never going to use, but you, you amaze yourself when it comes out, and all of a sudden there it is in your writing. Um, but, I mean, when I was just in Portland, Cisco was talking to me, and I always listen, and he asked me if I'd read Bolano. Oh, yeah. was a name that I've seen and seen and seen, and I almost picked up a book or two, and he's like, you're just missing it all. <laughs> and I've begun, and like, Wow. <laughs> I should have never written a word. Um, <laughs> but, no, I, that's that's essential. And Livia, like I said, when you read her, 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 her work, you can see that it's not one thing or two things that she brings. It's this it's, it's, it's great cornucopia uh, of influences and, and things she's read and, and absorbed. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> you mentioned Josh Whedon earlier. Were, are there anything else in films and television which influenced you? Oh, um, Geiger. Anything that Geiger's ever been involved with in, as far as films. And, of course, Alien. It's probably, probably Alien is the most influential visual experience um, on my work. 
ever. Uh, I still, I still will never forget watching that in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> he he yeah. died. He died recently. Yes, he did. Yeah, just a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll watch any. I I admit I'll watch anything that's considered eye candy, uh, just for the special effects. But I, of course, I appreciate you know stuff that that actually has a story to it. Um, and uh, Last year, I saw the movie Stoker uh, with Nicole Kidman uh, about this very creepy family in the South. Just beautifully done. No special effects. Um, it's it's horror. It's kind of psychological horror. Um, and uh, that was a huge influence on me for you know for a lot of the stuff that I wrote after that. Um, I actually have to when I'm writing something. I have to tend to not watch a lot of TV and, and go to movies because I'll come home and I'll basically buy the, be like I'll be writing out the plot or I'll just be writing out the special effects that I love. Okay. So I, I kind of have to I have to do my movie stuff and my TV stuff in between projects. So you say you go you do like you go cold turkey on uh, <laughs> television when you're writing. Yeah, yeah, I have to. Otherwise, I'm a I'm a binge watcher. I will I will sit there and watch, and five days later, I'll get up with Cheetos all over me and go, "What the hell?" So you are you are a big <laughs> Buffy every fan. Every season of something. <laughs> so, so you're a big Buffy fan, then I take it. I am. I'm a very big Buffy fan. Buffy and Angel. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome! I love hearing that. I'm. I actually watched Angel first. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. I, I didn't watch it when it was on TV. I accidentally caught an episode of Angel, you know, maybe a year or two after Angel was done. It was it was a rerun on TV, and I thought, oh man, that's that's kind of interesting. And uh, so then I went through all the DVDs, you know, one season one through five, and then I thought, oh, okay, I guess I better go watch Buffy now. So, <laughs> so yeah, uh, which one do you like better, Buffy or Angel? Uh, both. I like them both equally. I, I don't I, I think Buffy I mean I'm a woman I wish I could have been Buffy I write about a lot of women who are like Buffy um, mm -hmm. but Angel has a level of sophistication uh, because he moves through a different world and he's a different person and um, and the storylines were very different um, yeah. and and I love it too it was much more urban fantasy um, and then the last season just got insane but that was my favorite season because again they were at the law firm. And I think anyone who's ever worked in a huge cubicle farm in a huge skyscraper is like, yeah, of course there are demons working next to yeah, you. Know, my wife, she'll watch the seasons one through four with me, but she hates season five. She was telling me that even just last night. Really? Yeah. So it's a, it was a very different season. So it I, I'm always happy to meet another Buffy and Angel fan. So. What is what is she hated? Is it too much like work? <laughs> in, in she's a lawyer. Tells, you no, know, no. In her words last night, she said, "I want to. I only want to watch the seasons where they're not the bad guys." I'm like, "They're not the bad guys in season five. They just work." No, but they're this, they're this close. Yeah. yeah. See, that's what I love about it, is is that they really kind of skirt the line. Yeah. You no, know, and and there is a great deal of ambiguity when you have powers and you know lawyers. And, yeah, and lawyers. But what I loved about Buffy and Angel was that um, instead of having the old Christian good, bad, demons are evil, he kind of did, uh, you know, a little bit of different um, mythology in his universes, you know, where there was these, there were these, like, you know, different planes of existence, you know, in different dimensions. And they weren't necessarily good or evil, they were just different places where different creatures lived. You know, and how we perceived them was our own problem, and not necessarily theirs. So. And we even had we even had demons who were lounge singers. <laughs> Aww, <laughs> he was a great singer. <laughs> yeah, he was a great character. Yeah, he was. I can't remember his name. I just remember what he looks Lauren. like. Lauren. Lauren, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Lauren. Yeah. No, that's a well. I uh, for everyone that's not a Buffy and Angel fan, I apologize. But it's just great. <laughs> Uh, no, because one of, one of one of my favorite, and I'm just gonna. There's this there's this point in time when Fred becomes Illyria, this yeah, like, yeah I love a, uh, a Lovecraftian monster, right? Like Wolfram and Hart, 
In, in my time, they were the weakest of demons. <laughs> <laughs> I just find that, that, that little line to be so so touching. You know, that, that things change. Yeah, and when barely above the vampire, she says, in my yeah. time. Mm. Right. And then, and then the guy she's with says, huh, I guess they beefed up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what, are, what are a couple of your favorite Buffy and Angel episodes, since we're on this, this topic? Um... I know, I, I refuse to... Everybody loves a puppet episode. Oh my god! Um, oh yeah. I probably... Oh, well, now I'm going to have to just go back and start watching the whole series again. Um, I'm a bad one, yeah. I... Let's see. The All puppet right, one, he's gonna, just a puppet episode. Stand out episodes for me. Probably more Buffy than Angel, because I've seen Buffy more times. Um, mm -hmm. The episode where she's at college and she has the roommate that she's not getting along with, who's the demon, who just wants to go to college and be cool, and and and, and it just it just brought back a lot of college memories for me. Um, Hush, because I love Doug Jones and mm -hmm. anything he does, and it was just a brilliant, brilliant episode. Scared the pee out of me. Um, let's see. What was interesting about that, uh, the college episode that you mentioned was, you know, Buffy's just convinced that her roommate is a demon and everyone, all, all Buffy's friends think she's just losing it, you know. Yeah. You know, she's <laughs> jealous or something. Yeah, I'm pretty sure one of my college roommates was a demon. And I'm pretty sure at one point I was a demon to a college roommate. <laughs> yeah. Um... And I know that the ep the episodes or the season where she came after she came back from the dead, uh, a lot of people hate that. Think it's the worst season ever. I thought I I really loved a, a lot of those episodes. Um, there was one where she's they're living the same hours over and over again because there's a spell that Willow does. Right. Um, is it? Yeah. I, is it? I forget. I don't remember the logistics of it, but I just remember her. She's always in the shop, and she's picking up the candle that that um, smells like. Oh no! It was those. It was those dorks. They, oh no! It was the the three nerds. Yeah, it was yeah. the three villains. Yeah, they yeah. something on there that did that. Yeah, they were the trio. Yeah, yeah. the trio. <laughs> the trio. Yeah, yeah, that was a good one. So. Yeah. So yeah. Everybody out there watching is like, okay, Mike, get off the bus. Oh, God, thing. stop it already. <laughs> uh, how about the uh, Thomas Ligotti topic? Because I, I know you're a big fan. Um, you know, if, if if you were to explain to someone who's never read Thomas Ligotti, you know, and they say, hey, Livio, you know, what is it about this guy? Why do you like him? What's the deal with him? What, what, would, what would you say? Well, actually... I, I did the anthology for Joe because I wasn't convinced that I could do a Ligotti style story and I kind of have a lot of problems with his fiction because it's so dense and so bleak and quite frankly I feel like a fucking idiot with every story I read of his like I the concepts to me are so complex that by the end of it, I'm like, okay, well, I'm just fucking stupid. I don't know what I, I read. Um, and it makes me angry. <laughs> and I'm not reading it going, well, this is shit. He doesn't know how to write. It, clearly he does. He's brilliant. But I don't get a lot of it. Um, yeah, I, I, so I, he's not an influence. <laughs> and I kind of have a love-hate relationship with this fiction because I always read it hoping that there'll be some connection, but there's no, it's not an emotional connection for me. It's more like trying to figure out what it is he's he's talking about. Um, I don't know if I could describe to anyone how he writes, you know, if someone hasn't read his his stuff before. Um, well, I, I don't know, know if it's fair when I was reading your story in Grimscribe's Puppets, Furnace. Yeah. Uh, I had the exact same reactions. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck. Uh, what what does this mean? You know. So I had to read it a couple times. So. Yeah, I had that reaction too. That well, man. Well I'm, done. Yeah, well done. I was, I was I like, I don't, I don't even know what's going on. 
what is this? One of, one of, one of these ironies is here. The 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 what does that mean? <laughs> what was that? I said one of oh, the ironies here is is Olivia's yeah. been asked this question before, sort of, and here's yeah. her reply. Every time I finish one of Ligotti's stories, I put the book down and say to myself, oh, fuck it, I'll never write as well as this. I'm so stupid, I didn't even understand half of what was going on. And then I get angry and pick him up again and keep reading. Because, yep. God damn, I know that doesn't sound very inspiring. It is, but I just can't explain why. <laughs> That's from an interview she did previously with Weird Fiction on a review online. Yeah, yeah, that's it, it. exactly. Yep. Yeah, and that's what I was saying. That was my reaction to reading Furnace. I was like, "What does that mean?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I I do that with Cisco though all the time. It just, you know, it's like, why am I bothering? I didn't get this part, you know, or, but, but it was right. It, it and and it, and I think any great, uh, a lot of us read another great writer. Laird's written stuff. Livia's written stuff. Ligotti's written stuff. Cisco's writ written stuff. I finished it and I I didn't throw the book across the room, but there's this little piece of me that wanted to because it's like, shit, I'll never be able to write a tent as good as anything. <laughs> anything as good as that. Um, I think it's one of the big draws to us who are so deeply in love with literature. That's what we're looking for, that that power, that mystery, that, um, you know, we we want to know. It's, it's, it's like playing basketball against Michael Jordan. You have no hope of winning. But, boy, it's thrilling while you're out there trying to dribble, even though you look like an idiot. Um, sorry. <laughs> was was that your reaction, Joe, when you first read Chambers? What was that? Was no, no, because I was only a kid, and I had no intention of doing anything. I was just a reader. Writing, I wasn't going to write. That required talent. You know, the whole writing thing was, like, going to happen 20 years later, surely by accident. You know, well, when I mean, I most everybody else wrote, all, wrote when they were younger, they, or they wanted to write or tried to write. I, I never did any of that. I just, you know read Chambers and thought, wow, this is incredible, and wanted to read the next great book. Well, I kept, I, mean, I, 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 was, thinking, I was thinking more of rereading him over and over again, because I kept rereading in the Dragon's Court about it. I probably read that four times when I first read it, um, because I couldn't I find, figure out what was going I on. I, I, I find when I reread any, anybody, be it Ligotti, be it Chambers, or Cisco or, or Laird, um, that the first time I go through, it, it's almost like film. You know, the, the first time I've gone through it, the, the car is big and red and shiny, and you can't miss it. It's, it's like neon. And, and the second time through, there's a little sign in a window that I didn't notice the first time. Um, you know, so every, every rereading brings something different. And, and you get to look deeper, or you get to look in a completely different way. Um, Rereadings often are um, in a different color, let's say. Uh, you know, it, it, it's... I don't know, the, the first time I watched um, True Detective, it was coming to me this way. But on second viewing, I noticed this, then I noticed that. And, you know, things... Things don't fly by at the same speed, you know. Yeah, you know when I had uh, Nick, when I had Nick Mamatas on, uh, I asked him if it was true that he that he never reread a book, and he said, "Yeah, that's true. I never do." He, um, his, his comment was, "There's too many other books out there to read." And oh, there, I, there there's too I, many to read, but there's I, I there's too point, many. But you know, but you know, you got that favorite book. You want to you you do want to reread it over and over. Yeah. And as, as writers, we're often researching, so we need to go reread something. Um, you know, if, if I'm writing something and I need Obed Marsh, I don't remember how to spell Obed. i got to go pull a book off the shelf, and perhaps I just thumb through it till I find the spelling. But 
perhaps I read the this, this, this story. Well, um, you know, Joe, that's exactly how I figured out that um, who was it? Ephraim Waite is the hero, not the villain. Everybody thinks Ephraim's a bad guy. Mm -hmm. Well, at least, at least it's your view. I still think he's a bad guy. <laughs> there's, there's books that, all right, the other reason I reread is the very first time I heard the first Moby Grape album, the needle hit the, the LP, and Omaha played, and I wanted to be instantly out of the room. I thought it was absolute piece of crap. And 30 years later, I was somewhere, and somebody threw the CD in the player, and I hadn't heard Moby Grape in a billion years, and all of a sudden there was Omaha, and I was floored. It's like, wow. And I knew what it was. It just, how could I have been so wrong the first time? Um, so sometimes I want to go back and revisit things to, you know, um, reassess them. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's just things I love. Flickr. I read Flickr every year because it's just turned into like my favorite novel. Flickr. Uh, yeah, Theodore Rozak. It's a, it's 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 a it's a what seven eight hundred page novel about the secret history of film. Mm -hmm. just, it's it's a conspiracy theory novel that. I adore, um, you know. But rereading is, I I think a wonderful thing. Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm I'm so focused on music that I I can't conceive of, you know, not returning to uh, Brian Eno before and after Science and playing it all the time. So certain short stories or certain novels. I need to go back and hear them again. Uh, they, they were just too damn good. Um, we all rewatch movies. Why can't we reread? There's just as much pleasure in rereading Moby Dick as there is in rewatching Casablanca to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and because sometimes, like you say, Joe, your, the time where you first read it and the time that you read it again, decades may have passed. Not only have you changed as a person, but your knowledge has changed as well. And some of the in-jokes or references that you didn't get when you were 17 yeah. are simply made plain when you were 27. Yeah. yeah. Absolute, absolutely. You know, um... You know, at, at one age, you're totally enamored with something. I don't know, the color red or something. And and now, four decades later, that's boring, you know. Um, but yellow, wow. It, and any speck of yellow, it's like I'm on board. Um, and, and I don't mean that as far as the king in yellow. I just, but Pete's <laughs> absolutely right. This, this, this maturation process as we go through the decades and we add experience and our tastes continually um, are reinterpreted and, and modified. That, that, that pertains to literature to me. All of us love some bunch of films. L Livia talked about Alien. I'm sure if we query her, she's watched it how many times? A uh lot. God, maybe forty or fifty times. There you go. Who, who? Now, who would say that's a bad thing? I sure as hell wouldn't. I've owned it on video. No, I've owned it on DVD. <laughs> I owned it on Blu-ray. I've watched the first one. Well, I watched the first one three times in the theater, actually. Um, I, I probably watched it that many times. I love the film. It's one of my favorite films. So when I when my parents took me to see Alien in the theater, this is how I got to experience Alien. Oh no, man! My no. mother's hand clamped over my eyes. <laughs> oh, was it was your hands? Or was no, your hands? it was my mother's. My mother just put her hand over my face um, about halfway through the movie and did not let it come off. Wow. And it wasn't. And it wasn't the nude scene. That was no, it wasn't. It was the oh. 
It was when John Hurt had a stomach ache. It actually was <laughs> the, the first egg exploding. After that, it was done. Mm. Yeah. I still got to see it, but there were bars across my eyes. <laughs> what kind of movie it was when she took you? <laughs> but, but nobody thinks it's odd to rewatch and rewatch and review a film. But some people think it's odd to go back and 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 revisit a wonderful piece of literature. Um, I know I'm missing things because I'm reading something old when there's all these new things out there, but I'm never going to catch up anyway. Yeah. You know, it, that's not it's not possible, not unless somebody wants to give me another 500 years, and <laughs> and then still I'm not going to catch up. You then know, cause, stop reading. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. like I said, I was there in Portland, and Cisco said. Have you read Have you read Bolano? And I'm like, no, I keep seeing them, and but I and he's like, my God, you haven't read anything yet, then. So now I'm all of a sudden on this tear with the South American authors, and wow, how how eye opening. Um, you know, Olivia, and, I saw. And, and hopefully, it'll do something positive to my work. Livy, I saw um, somewhere online you mentioned when you were little reading about ancient civilizations that have disappeared and so forth that that really fascinated you. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everyone had the Time Life series of books, and um, uh, we were always watching, you know, In Search of with Leonard Nimoy narrating, and and <laughs> that stuff was absolutely fascinating to me. I couldn't get enough of it. I was insane for it. Yeah. Are you the Mayans? Oh and yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the Aztecs and and the you know the hieroglyphs that look like spaceships and spacesuits and you know all of the books, um, Chariot of the Gods. Oh my God. Oh God, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> and they let you into publishing. <laughs> um, that, the kind yeah, of people we even lost your mind and like. <laughs> Well, those were bestsellers, you know. I mean, maybe we left. Oh yeah, now. dark time during you know what was that? The late seventies. Mm -hmm. There yeah. wasn't a supermarket wire rack in America that didn't have a dozen copies of Eric von Donegan's Chariot of the Gods in it. Yeah. For a couple of years, I mean, you could buy that in any card shop, any supermarket. I mean, even in my one-horse dorp, you, you didn't need to go to a bookstore to buy that. But what did we know? That was a cool-ass book. <laughs> well, and you also... I mean, you know, we'd, find, we'd come to find out it was all... Most of it was all bullshit. But, it, it, you know, you took that home. You woke, you went up, you ran up to your bedroom and opened that baby, and you were cooking. Well, it, it got ruined for me by public... T uh, Nova on public television debunked it all in the special. I know, but up and up until those kind of things <laughs> occurred, those first, you know, that first week you were holding that puppy in your hands, that was great stuff, you know. Yeah, it's uh, kind of separate, though, wouldn't you say, Olivia? From, I mean, there's that legitimate fascination and study with ancient civilizations, you know, and, and what happened to some of them. I mean, we don't think they got abducted by aliens, but you know, what did happen, you know, and. Uh, yeah, well, so. again, it's 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 about you know mystery and like right. uh, Roanoke and Croatone and you know that you know and um, the mysteries you know in America all of those um, you know the Anasazi and and obviously spaceships didn't take these people away but you know it, it fascinates me that there were you know you know these settlements or or these groups of people or these civilizations and. and I know a lot of it is we know what happened to them, but you know, there's when you're growing up, you know, there's certain things that just kind of like form, you know, basic interests for the rest of your life, and and right. at that time, that that was one of the things. You, yeah, I believe you also said in that interview, uh, I, I just kind of uh, zoomed in on that a little bit because it's fascinating to me as well. And you said something to the effect of, you know, I wanted to read fiction that would, you know, 
that kind of fiction, or uh, you know, uh, re I, I can't remember your exact quote, but <laughs> you were fascinated with ancient civilizations, and you wanted to read if there was fiction like that, you wanted to read it, you know. Yeah, so. stuff that would take me away, you know, yeah. like put me in those times, you know, um, or or speculate about, you know, any any time other than. You know, very white '70s suburban Northwest America, which was, you know, very. Uh, it was very calm and and you know idyllic and and happy childhood, but mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot going on. Um, so I just made up a lot of shit in my head. <laughs> was there any work of fiction about ancient civilizations that you particularly liked? Yeah, good question. Wilbur Smith. Um, Morgan Llewellyn. Oh no! I mean, yay! I mean, <laughs> I'm spitballing. You know, every, it's like every Christmas I got a book by Morgan Llewellyn, or someone would give me a book by Morgan Llewellyn, and it was just not my thing. <laughs> no, and my grandmother on my father's side, bless her heart. She knew that I loved dress up and I loved old old and stuff, and she would give me romance novels written by oh. Barbara Hartland, and she in, in their basement in the library. My grandfather, the Brigadier General, his half of the room was like all of these military books and history and and books on Churchill, and then the other half of the room was solid pink, like someone just barfed Pepto Bismol all over it. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my god. <laughs> so, so I guess you never read Barbara Cartland. <laughs> I actually did read a couple of them because I remember reading about how she actually wrote them. She would sit down and dictate to her secretary and, and they would type and she would write a book like every afternoon. You know, she, she oh. I don't even know if that's true or not or she would just like she would write, she would uh, recite like maybe a couple thousand words saying this is what the book is and they would flesh it out. But she was, you know, she was like, I'd write a book every afternoon and then I have tea, you know, with my boas and stuff. And uh, so I read a couple and I, I thank God I don't remember them or I black them out or I just went to some dark place in the universe <laughs> where, I, where those memories were scrubbed from my head. <laughs> By aliens. Yes. Mm. From, from Egypt, Egyptian aliens <laughs> in chariots. <laughs> um, can you talk about, if you want to, uh, what you're working on right now and anything else that you might have coming out soon? Yeah. Um, I will. It's very frustrating. I have I have three stories right now that have been bought, but I can't talk about any of them. But they should all be out sometime this year. Um, one was just bought yesterday by Ellen, um, cool. that I can tell you. Um, and let's see. Uh, I have, um, oh, um, also Ellen bought a story for her Nightmare Carnival anthology uh, that's being put out, is it by Dark Horse? Um, I think it is, actually. Yeah. One of the two. Yeah, she wanted a, a story on a carnival, and I gave her something that was a little bit fucked up, but she accepted it. <laughs> but let's just say, if you read Furnace and you sort of enjoyed it, I think that my story, which is called The Mysteries uh, in Nightmare Carnival, will elicit pretty much the same response. It'll be, I have no idea what's going on. I didn't know what I was do, writing when I wrote it. Um, and that, so that one I can tell you about. And then the others I can't. And then uh, right now what I'm working on starting tomorrow is I'm finishing up a novella uh, that doesn't really have a market, but there's a couple of places that I can send it to. Um, and uh, then uh, I should work on two more stories, and they'll round out uh, what will uh, be my hopefully my second collection. Um, I don't have a publisher yet for it, um, you know. But well, that's easy to do. But 
Yeah, I'll I'll have enough stories that I like that will that will make up a second collection, and then over this summer, um, I'm going to be finishing a novel that I I started actually last year before my whole thing with I my was restructured out of my my publishing job and then I had to find a new job and then I had a little health crisis so two, 2013 was kind of a sucky year for me so the novel kinda of got put to the side but now I'll be starting it up again and I have to finish it by October because then I have four more invites <laughs> that will be due at the end of the year so, awesome. so yeah that's what I'm doing <laughs> Yeah, you and in September, the Starry Wisdom comes out. And oh! Olivia has a contribution in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That it's comes out. At, and huh? so do I. Yeah, just about every one of us that we could name in the next five minutes. Every, every, everyone's in it. Yeah, I think um, everyone in horror is in it. Well, <laughs> almost. Every, everybody you want to read. Uh, yeah. Karen, Karen Warren's got a story in there. Karen Tidbeck's got a story in there. Uh, Stranzis has got an entry. Cisco's got an entry. Gemma Files, Molly Tanzer. Yep. Laird, Langan, Gavin. The, the, your usual suspects. It's going to be wonderful. And, and I read a whole lot of them. I had, you know, access. And, wow. Did you read mine? Yes, I did. Is that the is that the anthology with all the books? Yes. Yeah, yeah. What, it, what, it, it, what it is is, it, is is the premise is it, Nate Peterson's the editor, and the premise is that in what eighteen seventy seven the Starry Wisdom was disbanded, and their library went into an auction, and this will be a period replica of an 1888 uh, book auction catalog and all the writers I've mentioned and a ton more each wrote an essay about a particular book like I, I of course was drafted to do the essay on the King and Yellow volume that's in the auction so um, and and everyone did something else. So there's uh, you know there's a an essay on a Necronomicon and one on the Panop uh, Panope scriptures and one on the Robin Spriggs did the Dole Chants as I recall um, and, and so story, on and so on. My story is actually based on on a book you created in uh, I forget which novel. Nightmare's Disciple, which yeah. blew my mind when I found out about that. I had no knowledge. In well, talk, talk about which, that again. Which, which book was it? Yeah. Um, uh, Las Reglas de Ruina. Yeah. I was I was floored. Couldn't be more honored that someone of Livia's talent would would yeah and it very also it, it isn't written yet but next year in the spring will be Casilda's song which is another King and Yellow anthology I'm doing and Livia has said she'll uh, write something so um, I Absolutely over the moon to read a Olivia Llewellyn story that has something to do in some way, shape, or form with King and Yellow. Um, I, I already have the idea. I know exactly what I'm going to write about. You're going to love I, it. Yeah, I'm. I have no. I have no. You, you. You were number one on my list, Steve. Even though it was like sort of invisible because I wasn't going to ask you because I didn't want to get in trouble. Um, <laughs> But uh, that went, boy, that went well. Um, <laughs> well, so that's no, the time when I wasn't taking any invites because I was still recovering from my hospital stay and right. like trying to figure out my new job and so yeah. But but yeah, now I'm 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 doing. Yeah, no, this is all again, that, so. that, that that you're plunging into the novel again. I couldn't be more thrilled that the next collection is is basically done. Yay, Jesus, hurry up. 
You know, hurry isn't one of the words I use to describe my writing process at yeah, all. Yeah, I, I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> You're not as bad as Langan, though. You're not as bad as Langan. He's, he gets the blue ribbon for... Really? Oh, I feel so much better now. I Oh, you're, you're fast compared to Langan. Um, yeah, even Ellen said something about him when she was on. Well, the, but the whole thing, I, I want to say strictly from a, an editorial, the editorial side of the aisle, um, <laughs> you may wait a bit for Langan and Llewellyn, but every <laughs> second you wait is worth its weight in gold. Every These, second? Yes, every, every second. They're, 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 they're fucking amazing. <laughs> when, you, when you get it, it's crisp, and you open it, it's crisp. It's just, it's wonderful. You know he's yeah. watching. You know he's watching. That's why you're okay, saying. Okay, so, so, <laughs> I, you know. I, the, say, I, said, I just said he's brilliant and wonderful. So I'm going to make him write faster, and it will make me write faster. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the thing is, is these things all, and I only pick on them. They're, they're, these things come at the rate they're going to come. Yeah, exactly. And, and sometimes they don't come at all. I mean, <clears throat> we, we've heard over the years how many times from, from Kiernan. You know, uh, the hell with that one. You know, and and yeah, we never hear about it again. Or or years later, something gets rescued. You know, it wasn't time for for conception on that particular occasion. Th that happens. What's what's thrilling is that Livy is back and writing so much. I mean, that this she is no ifs ands or buts. What one of the best working. Um, so to have a, a substantial amount of new material coming from her desk is just an absolute thrill. Um, you know, uh, re I, I can think of a half a dozen readers, friends of mine, who will just be, well, they'll, they hopefully they have rubber pants when they hear all this information. <laughs> um, and that's the kind of reaction I want to get out of readers and editors is, you know. <laughs> well, if you said... <laughs> When, when is the second collection coming? Well, I don't know because I have to. I have to, you know, get all of the stories that I want to put into it, and then I haven't even contacted any any publishers or presses, no editors, um, you know, yet. That that'll happen when I when I know exactly what stories when I have my word count. Um, I there's I mean there's some places I'd like to send it to, but most a lot or I shouldn't say most a lot of presses. That I want to don't really have submission guidelines for short for collections, and so I don't know even if I can just send them a query saying, "Hey, you know, at the end of the year, I'm going to have X amount of stories or whatever." Um, you know, I don't I don't really know how to go about doing that. Um, when I published published with Lefe, um, Steve knew me. He he'd known me for many years. He'd always wanted to publish something. So you know, he he continually asked me. So when the time was right, I said, Yeah, I have enough. I can you know, I'll send it to you. Um, so this is actually, even though it'll be my second collection, it's kind of a new process for me. Um, you know, so. Well, I'm I'm glad to hear it's coming at some point though. That's great. Yeah. yeah, and it'll and once once you decide you have something you want to let publishers look at, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of venues to think about, and I'm sure it'll get snapped up really quick. I hope that would that would be nice. I, I can think not, of a couple I, people off the top of my head who will take it in a microsecond. If not, I've got ants and I've got bees at my command. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why you're there in your apartment? You're training them? Yeah, yeah. No, they're training me. <laughs> oh. You watched Phase Four? Have you seen the movie Phase Four? Oh yes. The ants are training four, us. <laughs> Did you ever see them? As, uh... Oh, are you kidding? Yeah. Every year, when it every year when the, I see the first ants in my apartment, I always post a still from them or a, a clip. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. <laughs> Yeah, it when I was four or five, they they you know obviously it's older than that was probably 1975, but they they showed it in the theater, uh, 
at that time, my parents took me to see it. it. Scared the hell out of me. I don't know why they took a four year old to see them. But if that scared you, I can't even imagine what Alien did to you. <laughs> I was a lot older when I saw Alien. What, what did you see in 75? Phase mm -hmm. four of the, was that phase four or was that them? What did you say, Rick? What, which film did you see in 75? Them. Well, because that came out like around 1950 or something. Yeah, I, I know they. they Three uh, or something, but yeah, back they then. They did. They did. Uh, they decided to show it in a local theater again for whatever oh. reason. I don't know. So. Meanwhile. And, uh, I just started walking outside and being so glad that after the movie and being so glad that there was not giant ants roaming around, you know. Due to atomic uh, bombs that have all been exploded after the first one. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't understand that part at the time. I just. Understood giant ants. So, <laughs> well, you should you, um, imagine what it was like when you know on Saturday afternoon you see them and you just did duck and cover Friday morning in, in <laughs> class. I mean, that was well, Rick, you got to remember duck and cover, right? We, we, we had the air raid drills, yeah. I mean, that was scary as shit watching some of those films, you know. Well, since we're on the topic, uh, Olivia, have you seen Godzilla yet? No, I haven't. Um, you know, I don't see a lot of movies anymore because it's so expensive, and I have like zero tolerance for people in theater. Oh, mm. I, I, I just, I seriously, I lose my shit. You know, it's like bad behavior in the theater. It's like, no, I've already paid fifteen, sixteen, eighteen dollars. Fuck that. So, um, so I probably, I probably won't see it. You know, I very rarely see movies anymore. Most of the people I know in the New York area, you know, they have families, they have kids, you know, they, you know, they have their people to see it with. And um, I'm like the creepy single person who's like, I want to go too. And they're like, no, no, I don't think so. Well, oh, I, I love going to the movies, but just by, it's a lot of fun, I think. You know, just, you're getting, oh, no, I, you know, you're you know, getting away from the theater, theater. It's, it's the like, theater. I, I agree with Livia. Shut up. I just paid a lot of money to see it. <laughs> You know? Well, I remember one time I went to see this movie in the middle of the day, which is something I love to do when everybody else is at work. Yeah, that yeah, I love. I was, I was the only one in the theater, this huge, huge stadium theater. So then five minutes before the movie starts, this this guy comes in, and he sits right beside me. Yes, of course. <laughs> and I look at him, and I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm just trying to be friendly. And I said, I got enough fucking friends in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> just how friendly was he trying to be? Was he yeah, like, I don't want that kind of friend, yeah. Put your hand in the coat on. Corner. <laughs> you want to be alone and enjoy the movie. That's like Times Square Theater friendly. <laughs> <laughs> this, could, this could be a plot for a horror story, Mike. Save it. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like something Ramsey Campbell would write about. Oh, yeah. I, just, I could not believe he did that. And I told my wife about it later, and she's like, because I'm, I'm a pretty laid-back guy, and she's like, you said that? And I'm like, yeah, don't fuck with my theater time, you know? I, I used to have a buddy who used to manage a theater. So I used to go Tuesday to the first show at 1, 1, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Always empty. Mm-hmm. Best yeah, time cool. in the, it used to be the best time to see a film. You don't have to worry about people coughing or talking. And of course, way back then there was nothing like cell phones and whatnot. You know. Well, Logan and I are going to go see Godzilla in a couple of hours because Rick keeps telling me that it's really great. And but I'm lucky because it's this small town theater. I'll bet on a Sunday evening three other people will be in the theater. You know. Yeah. So. All right, that's cool. And yeah. also, the, the the rush was like two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all, yeah. I, mean, I, I used to during the seventies. I got dragged by my paramour. Opening night, Jaws. Opening night, Alien. Opening night, Exorcist. Opening night, this. Oh, you now, know. The only movie I've ever seen opening nights was Lord of the Rings movies. I yeah. saw all of those opening night, and, and yeah. you know, it was in a big theater, and I was with some friends, and that was cool. The, I remember also seeing, I was working at Tor, um, I was uh, one of Tom Doherty's two assistants, 
and everyone in the office, or most of the people in the office, we all went to see um, The Phantom Menace. <laughs> what a disappointment. So excited. Yeah. Oh my god, these grown men were like trembling, like little like girls, mm -hmm. you know, with their communion dresses on. You know, they were just like, and I was like, oh, Star Wars, you know, I love Star Wars, you know. Um, and all I remember is afterwards sitting in some dive bar that had sawdust on the floor, and we were all at this table, and these these same grown men were just like sitting, looking at their beers, like <laughs> tears running down their faces. Oh my! God, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's the it's one of them really I think was saying the. I I just it was like it was speechless. You know, we were all speechless. The Phantom Menace is like, is like Lucas just said, oh, I have billions of fans. Fuck you, guys. Yeah. Let's <laughs> think of this crap. I don't need to work anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I know you idiots are going to go see it anyway, you know? So. Yeah. That was my last Star Wars movie in the theater. Oh. Well, I will tell you that my wife and I just yesterday finished season five of True Blood. And, and looked at each other and said, what the hell happened? I gave up after season three. Yeah, I well, after season three. <laughs> oh, my God. It's like, w was there a shark? Did somebody jump that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think all of those seasons were sharks. It was just sharks after yeah, sharks so, after yeah, sharks. It was so horrendously bad, and I'm sitting there trying to figure out, like, what the hell happened to the writers from season one? And It was... Just horrific, and it's the same oh, deal. You just run something into the ground. You hate it when a show dies, which you love. Uh, yeah. Was like when, I don't know if Joe remembers this. When we were kids, but like the man from Uncle went horribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great. That's a great title for a book. The man from Uncle went horribly wrong. I mean, but, actually, actually, the last season that they cut short in half that was pretty good. But the third season. It's just monstrous. Yeah. You know, I will <laughs> never feel forgive. good about it. I, I, I just can't ever forgive the, the, the year that Love Boat turned bad. <laughs> oh my god. That was the that was the first year of the first episode. That's what <laughs> Do you guys remember because I, I remember we used to grow we were growing up and we would rush home and we would watch Love Boat and Fantasy Island. And that was like high level entertainment. At least in Love my Boat? What the fuck kind of drugs were they giving you, kid? <laughs> well, that's when they destroyed television because you couldn't have violence. You know, it was right. Like, right. I, went, I, I wonder. Went, though, I wonder. I wonder how hard it would be get to get the permission for Love Boat. I'd like to do a a Love Boat anthology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get all these you writers and everybody going show. on this like romantic cruise, and what goes wrong? <laughs> Everything. Wait, didn't James Lovegrove do a story about this? Uh, I don't know. Maybe even the whole novel about this his this cruise ship that goes horribly wrong. Yeah, Maybe. but I want to be able to use the doctor and the captain and and you remember that girl who was like the, the cruise think, director, you know, Lauren yeah. Lauren Tweez. I yeah, remember well, yeah. with the little haircut. I, yeah. We got to have we. It, it's all different people. You know, I mean, maybe it's one voyage, and all the writers write a different, you know, they're in different compartments. What goes on on this cruise? All right, but you know what I want to do? I want to bring George and Wheezy Jefferson. To oh, there you go. Well, yeah, we could have people from other TV shows come on board as a, uh, you know, for a three-day cruise or something, you know? Sergeant Wajahowitz. Gilligan? Gil Gilligan and the captain return to sea. It's his first time after being stranded on that island. <laughs> and, and, and have what's recently gone wrong with cruises go wrong with this one. Oh! <laughs> you know, yeah. when they get stranded, all the, food, the captain, you know, lets but, the but can you Can you imagine doing something like that when you take all serious writers and, like, really... Is this the same them? cruise that Kolchak went on with the werewolf? Yeah, Kolchak yeah. could go on a cruise. I <laughs> it. You know, I, I mean, Kid Dynamite, uh, Jimmy, whatever his name was, he's got to be there, right? Jimmy, J.J. Walker. This web chat has gone horribly awry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, 
that. <laughs> does that. I will do that from time to time. Yeah, but the audio. So whoever owns the rights out there for the Love Boat, I know you're watching this video. Is it Tori Spelling? Yeah, Tori, Tori, Tori Spelling. Wait a minute. She was in that Cthulhu movie. She was actually <laughs> really good in that movie. Tori, darling, I'm not brown nosing here. You were. You were a great people. Um, I didn't like anything else I ever saw you do in that 902 thing there. Um, <laughs> but in Cthulhu, you were really good. So if you want to, like, give us the rights to monkey around with this shit, um, let me know. He was creepy in Cthulhu. <laughs> yeah, but it worked. It worked. That's Even what as we loved her in, in that movie. That was pretty hilarious. I, I, I also like how they modernize it. We now learn that deep ones are anti-gay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. Well, the other nice thing about this, this theater is, I, I, I'm not rich, you know, these small town theaters, you, it's uh, not very expensive. So, great. Right. So, mm -hmm. I took my son to see Godzilla IMAX 3D. Oh, that's expensive. $18 a ticket. Aye. I I can see IMAX, but I can't see 3D. It starts to put me to sleep. I don't like 3D. I saw the Avengers in 3D and... No, it wasn't the Avengers. It was Spider-Man. Well, they're all the same movie, so you see. <laughs> no, there's Marvel and there's D. Well, you know, sorta. Of. It was like three and a half years ago. Whatever superhero movie I went and saw was in 3D, and I didn't like. I liked the movie, okay. I did not like 3D. Well, I went through the horror of seeing Green Lantern in 3D. So. Oh my God. <laughs> Never, never, I said, never again am I going to any movie in 3D. It was overstuffed and terrible and regular whatever it was, Panavision or Technicolor or 3D, yeah. no way. Well, I deliberately look at this, you know, because usually they have two theaters. One shows it in 2D, one shows it in 3D, and even if it's the time doesn't fit in, I'm going to the 2D one. Hmm. And I really wanted to like that movie. Mark Strong as Sinestro... That instant home run, you know, I was all excited for that. But, <laughs> Ryan Reynolds is Al Jordan. Well, I wasn't so excited about that. <laughs> but Mark Strong, Mark Strong is one of those actors who I think has got all kinds of chops. Uh, I, I I adore the guy. He's he's like he's he's like uh, Mark Ruffalo. If he's in it, I want to see what he did. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I love that guy. The, the, he's a great actor, but he, he seems to get always getting cast in these uh, franchises that don't work out. Green Lantern, yeah, John uh, Carter. What, yeah, but except for I really like John Carter. Twenty-five years from now, John Carter is going to be appreciated for what? How? How? I mean, they did a really marvelous job. I, I agree with you on that. I mean, my to my I mean, the, the only, was not Green Lantern. The only flaw is all the clothes she had on. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's face it. If you go back to the original Burroughs, that chick stark raving new. <laughs> and didn't Disney also, create that movie? Yeah. yeah. Also, she should have been. She should have been the person they cast as Wonder Woman. <clears throat> Maybe, yeah. She looks it. This yeah, other girl looks like she needs a goddamn sandwich. How's she going to be Wonder Woman? I don't know these people. <laughs> Gia somebody. Yeah. Or somebody Gia or something like that. But we do need... Wonder Woman would be... Is something that we need desperately. And it needs to be done right. I mean... Well, she doesn't um, belong in the Batman Superman movie. So forget Batman and forget Superman. I love Batman and Superman. I have the ability to kick you. But oh. Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman could be brilliant if somebody really gave a shit. Look, you know, I, fine, but you know, honestly, if you want, we need a min we need more minorities. We need a full Rocket Raccoon movie. Oh, for Christ. Oh, we'll start out with Guardians of the Galaxy. Be satisfied. <laughs> yeah. You know, 
I mean, we, we, we got two minorities in there, raccoons and plant people. Uh, no, we need Luke Cage movie. Wait, wait. Hold it, hold it, guys. We've we lost need a Black baby. Panther movie. <laughs> this is the look no. my wife gets. And yeah, we've we've deviated far too far. Maybe we okay. should ask well, Olivia about know, her favorite movie. As much as I love time. listening to you guys talk about superhero movies. <laughs> <laughs> what, was the what was the reaction uh, growing up to all these guys who were into superheroes? Was it like, what are they into? Were they weird? I, I, most of the guys I was around with were uh, guys who were into Star Trek. They were, they weren't into like the, you know, they weren't into to comic books that much. They were more into Star Trek. Well, you mentioned you know, love Alien. Um, what are a few other? Uh, since we're talking about movies, what are a few of other of your favorite movies? I'm afraid to say anything because we're going to go on like a huge tangent. <laughs> no, 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 no. We won't. <laughs> we won't. We'll, we'll we'll focus back on you. I promise. Um, David Cronenberg and David Lynch mm. are two of my favorite directors. Um, pretty much anything they do. Um, Blue Velvet, I absolutely love. Dead Ringers. Um, Inland Empire, the best movie ever made. What? Inland Empire, one of the best movies ever made. Inland Empire? <clears throat> yeah. No. David Lynch, Inland Empire. I consider it one of the best movies ever made. Hmm. You like Twin Peaks, Olivia? You, you don't know Inland Is Empire? <laughs> I'm yeah. Is that a kind of? <laughs> uh, yes, I do. I do love Twin Peaks. Um, although I only I saw it on TV. I've not seen it yet. On I know it's coming out on Blu-ray um, in the next couple of months, and I haven't seen it since it went off the air. Um, oh, so. Wow. Twenty-five years. Uh, aren't yeah. they doing a remake? I think they're doing a remake. Yeah, I've been watching it on Netflix. It's it's instant. Um, it holds up. It's it's kind of a letdown because I know how it ends. <laughs> um, you know who killed Laura Palmer? Yeah, I, you know you can see all the clues now. You're not distracted, but um, yeah. so Livia, did you say you worked for Core? For yes, I did. Yeah. So you know, I, I I know Dave Hartwell, and he has great stories about so. The publishing world, you you've got to have something you can tell us. Or, I was only really there for eight months, and it was I love the people, but the job made me absolutely miserable. Mm -hmm. um, so I really, I mean, I wasn't. Yeah, I don't think I can talk about it. <laughs> Doing therapy you know, too without getting into the kind of trouble that would kind of end my career because I really hated that job. I love Tom. I love Tor. You know, I would love to get a book published by them if he ever forgives me for quitting after eight months. Um, you know, but it was just, it was not the right job for me. It, it, was, it was basically the equivalent of an editorial manager job and I thought it would be more like administrative assistant and I was in way over my head. And so I left. So, so yeah, that's my story. <laughs> Not the one you were expecting, but it's the one I'm working with. <laughs> did, did, did you get to read at least some sci-fi and fantasy for free since they were publishing so much back then? Well, the great thing about... I, I remember the interview I had with Tom when I was first applying for the job, and it was absolutely... It was like the best interview I've ever had in my life. For the first time, I was talking with someone who loved science fiction as much as I did and who knew so much and was so influential. And um, he was thrilled that he was talking with someone who was like, who's, who's Frank Herbert? You know, um, you know I, was, I was telling him what I liked, and, and they were actual novels that he'd had a hand in publishing or, or he knew the authors intimately. And when I left my interview, my job interview, I was carrying two grocery sacks of books. He just, wow. he just walked down the walls. He was like, "You got to read this. You got to read that." You get it. I mean, it was amazing, you know. And and I, 
after I left Tor, I worked for Wiley, which is was nonfiction. Um, I worked in the business section, tax guides, hedge funds. You know, it was not as much fun. <laughs> I, the job was easier. You know, it was my I, my skill set was better suited for the job there. But um, you know, I really miss you know talking with people about books and about literature and and you know it it was great it was really great yeah. well I want to read something from your about page on your website uh, at night I write about lonely girls who sing to colossal sentient engines born of Tesla secret journals longhorn demons lost in endless tracks of suburbia the giant biomechanical insects and their sassy female charges. Mothers who are good monsters, monsters who are good mothers. The mysterious labyrinth of human and creature couplings. The joy of solitude and the horror of the broken heart. So I don't think I could put it any better than that, that for everybody watching, you know, read Livia's stuff. You know, go pick up Engines of Desire. I've got the link on my website and, and anything else she writes. So... So I really appreciate you coming on, Livia. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate you having me. Sorry we got a little sidetracked, but we tend to do that. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, so thanks a lot. Um, and anything else we want to ask Livia before we let her get back to her evening? Or did we to cover it all? <laughs> Pardon me? To my aunt killing. Oh, is that you got an ant infestation? Oh yeah, every year. She's I'm killing them. Or they're training her. Yes. Have you tried dry ice? No, I have cinnamon. Okay. Yeah, they can't cross cinnamon because it it stings their mandibles. So everything's covered in cinnamon. You buy those little hotel-like things where they crawl into and get killed. No, because I would need a hotel the size of the block that I live on um, in order to kill all these insects. So. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a detente up here. <laughs> it's really, there's no killing. <laughs> it's just I draw well, a line in cinnamon. <laughs> well, thanks again for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and, and talk you. with us. So, And uh, guys, thanks for, for being here too, and everyone, thanks for watching. So. Thanks, Libby. Thanks. And I hope to talk to you soon.